Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Sarah Lovell about landscape-level agroforestry. Agroforestry is where trees are grown alongside other crops or livestock. It's an extremely flexible practice that can be adapted to both urban and rural environments and at a variety of scales. This episode, Sarah discusses the various uses and forms of agroforestry, how agroforestry can benefit both farmers and their surrounding communities, and some tips for implementing agroforestry at scale. Don't forget to listen to the end of the show for our next student spotlight as well. We'll talk more about all that in a minute, but before we dive in, we wanted to thank our sponsors, starting with Gasman Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FPIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time simultaneously from static or automated chambers and ruminant emissions. Visit www.gasmet.com, that's gasmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gasmet.com for more information. Our second sponsor is Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metagroup.com slash fieldlabearth. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show today. Today, we have Dr. Sarah Lovell with us. Sarah serves as the H.E. Garrett Endowed Chair Professor and the Director for the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. This appointment follows 10 years she served on the faculty at the University of Illinois and a previous three years on the faculty at University of Vermont. Her research philosophy has evolved from an interdisciplinary background, including a master's and PhD in agronomy, followed by a master in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois. With a focus on the analysis and design of multifunctional landscapes, Dr. Lovell's research program has emphasized whole farm planning, productive agroforestry, and urban agriculture. From that body of work, she has published over 60 peer-reviewed journal articles, many in multidisciplinary journals. She's been awarded over $12 million in competitive grants, and Dr. Lovell is committed to improving the resiliency of our food system through perennial cropping systems that supply nutrient-dense, healthy products. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Wonderful. We are so glad to have you on today to talk about agroforestry. This is actually uh, part one of a two-episode little pairing we're doing on agroforestry, and it's coming out of the publication of the newest edition of North American Agroforestry, as well as a uh, special section in Urban Agriculture and Regional Food Systems, which is the journal for which you are editor, and also a spread in our CSA News Magazine. So just to, uh, to pitch that a little bit to listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about the book and the special section as you are involved in both of those things? Yeah, so the <clears throat> the book is a new edition of a, a book that's really served as the primary textbook for programs in agroforestry. So we have at the University of Missouri have a master's degree program and a PhD program in agroforestry. And this is a textbook that's been used for that course over a number of years. So getting this updated edition is really exciting and each one of those individual chapters has new content in it, and then there are also brand new chapters. And so I contributed to one of the, the new chapters. So that's kind of the story with the book. The special issue that we had in urban agriculture and regional food systems was on urban agroforestry. So thinking about taking that agroforestry concept and what the applications would be in urban areas. So I think we ended up with um, about seven different papers that are that are part of that special issue. Excellent. Thank you for an update on that. So 
to get us started, then I think what would be helpful would be to describe what agroforestry is. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then uh, how that works with urban agroforestry as well? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, and a lot of people haven't heard of agroforestry. It's basically two words, agro for agriculture and forestry, uh, indicating the trees that are in those systems. So one of the definitions that we typically use is trees and shrubs that are integrated with crops or livestock. And the types of systems that we're talking about that people are probably most familiar with would be things like windbreaks that are um, installed next to a, a cropping system or maybe next to a livestock area. <clears throat> Another common example would be forested riparian buffers, where we try to protect those waterways by planting those areas in trees and shrubs and other mixed species to improve the water quality. So yeah, and then if we're talking about the urban applications, that's taking the same concept, um, but often what we'll see there is kind of a multi-layered type of system that really focuses on the edible species and the trees and shrubs themselves offering edible products. So in a multi-strata, multi-layered approach, you could have maybe nut trees in the top layer and then an understory that has smaller trees like maybe a pawpaw tree um, and then some shrubs. Uh, a variety of different shrubs can be grown in that understory like elderberry, um, service berry is another one, or June berry that we see in those areas. And then also there can be species that are grown at the ground layer as well. Okay. I have a couple questions off of that. So um, I was definitely in the group that did not know what agroforestry was. So this is going to be a very foolish question, but I want to ask it anyway. Is I thought when I heard agroforestry, I was like, oh, like the trees you plant for lumber. Is that just then forestry? <laughs> or like, what is the term for farming trees for just like lumber as opposed to incorporating them into like an agricultural field? Okay, that's a great question. And every time I say agroforestry to people that aren't familiar with it, they hear forestry. And so they think exactly what you're talking about. And so timber production is part of forestry. That's correct, but we do have applications that can include timber crops within agroforestry. And so one of the practices that does that is called alley cropping. So in that case, you would you could plant the timber species in rows uh, at the same um, distance that they would norm normally be planted for timber production. But what makes it uniquely agroforestry is that between those planted rows, you have some other crop which could be any crop that you can imagine. In the, in the early years when the trees are small, there are a lot of options because you're still getting sunlight into that area. But then as, the, as those trees get larger, um, you might have to transition to species that are more shade tolerant or even put livestock in there. So, so one thing that's common is to have timber production and actually establish a forage in the ground layer and have livestock graze that area. So you have dual different products that you're producing. That can be helpful for because timber production, a lot of those species take a number of years, sometimes, you know, decades to reach the level for their harvest. And so getting some sort of income um, until they get to that point can be really valuable for a landowner. Sure, sure. Okay, then I, I'm adding more questions and getting us further and further away from our script. But <laughs> I, I'm very curious. Why why does not everybody who does timber production do that? Is it just the cost or is it just like the landscape isn't very good for getting like the mechanized uh, machinery you need in there? Like, wh why not everybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of asked that question, too. Why not everybody? And I think it's mostly um, there. You're adding more complexity to the system, which requires new levels of knowledge for different types of management that has to happen for different species in the system. So um, you're kind of dependent on what the soil and geographic conditions are. So you're constrained in what species would be adapted to that environment or livestock would be adapted. And then, you know, if you imagine the case of livestock, if you commit to doing that, 
you're now committing yourself to managing livestock, which is a whole new uh, level of commitment for a landowner. So those are some of the things that can be constraints. But in nearly any type of setting, I think there are some really good alternatives for for a landowner or farmer who's interested in diversifying, having an extra level of income, and does have the interest and experience to be able to manage a couple of different species. Okay. That, that by the way, for anyone listening, is not at all a criticism of any farmer who's doing lumber without these added things. I know it's a lot. So that I, I just ask the questions because, you know, I always hear these ideas that sound really good. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, there's more than just just doing it like it's complicated right right it takes extra it takes more time and labor is often a really large constraint for landowners and farmers hugely hugely so far be it for me to criticize farmers ever right (laughs) um okay and then so then my other question bringing us slowly back (laughs) is for the urban agroforestry is that like where is that done is it in a park Um, I know people are sometimes like, well, why don't you just plant fruit trees along sidewalks, which is like, as I understand, maybe not a great idea because of all the nuts and seeds and things like that. Um, But I mean, where does this occur in in urban environments? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, And it can occur in a variety of different places. But uh, for each different kind of setting, there might be a different design for it and even different species that would be appropriate. So you mentioned the planting along like a sidewalk or roadway or something like that, which is maybe the first thing that urban foresters or urban planners would be concerned about because, you know, if you have, say, nut trees that are dropping large, maybe walnuts or other uh, nut crops onto the sidewalk or other areas, those can be a legitimate tripping hazard for pedestrians who are in that area. And even with apples or other fruits, you might not want those materials just falling into those areas. The other thing that we get a little bit concerned about along roadways is the potential for airborne contaminants to impact the the edible items that would be grown in those areas. So in many cases, that's not the best (laughs) scenario, but there are a, a lot of other opportunities. So Another thing you mentioned was parks. Many cities have large, large acreages of land dedicated to parks and other sorts of green spaces that are have been managed over many years, are very low in any sort of soil contamination issues and uh, very clean and healthy environments. And those can be excellent places to integrate agroforestry as a you know, a food forest, kind of that multi-layered approach that I talked about. We also see urban orchards in those areas. So you might have a mix of orchard crops and berry shrubs and even have that integrated with other forms of urban agriculture that might include like vegetable production. Um, And we do see people do it in their own private spaces as well, in their backyard spaces. Um, The concept of permaculture is becoming more popular and people more people are hearing about that. And permaculture, when it uses woody plants, is a form of you know this urban agroforestry or food forest concept. Um, and so even in those small spaces, if people are strategic with the species that they select, they can do it in their own backyard. Nice. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for allowing me to ask all these rando questions out of the blue. So moving back to something you mentioned earlier is kind of some of the functions of agroforests that people might be familiar with, the windbreaks, the uh, riparian buffers, which is like riparian is just along water areas right? Um, for people not familiar with that. So can you tell me what are some of the kind of main functions that you're looking at in agroforestry uh, and like what those benefits are that you're looking for from those functions? Yeah. So within agroforestry, um, I fit it in the framework that I do a lot of my research in, which is the concept of multifunctional landscapes. 
And I kind of divide, categorize the functions into three different areas. Um, so there's production functions, and that's the, those are the things that we traditionally think about with agriculture, that you're producing food, feed, other products, even like cut flowers or Christmas trees or things like that. Um, so that's one area. Um, the agroforestry practices are also really good at another dimension, which is the ecological functions. So they offer a lot of benefits for the environment that include things like conserving biodiversity and protecting water quality, which would be relevant for the riparian forest buffer that you mentioned. Um, sequestering carbon is also a really great one with agroforestry because with the trees, you are guaranteeing that you're getting carbon sequestration in that above ground biomass. And it's really easy to see, it's easy to estimate. So like in terms of connecting in with carbon markets um, and things like that, I think there's a lot of potential with agroforestry. And then the final area would be the cultural dimensions, the cultural functions. And agroforestry, the integration of those trees into the landscape can also impact things like the recreational values of the landscape. Think about a landowner who has an area that includes some treed habitat, having maybe more opportunities for hunting or hiking or bird watching, things like that. Um, also aesthetics, just the look, the aesthetic and visual quality of the rural landscape. Um, studies have shown that people typically prefer, prefer a very diverse landscape that includes combinations of kind of treed habitats with lower grown either cropping areas or pasture areas. So it can improve there too. And then there are also great opportunities for things like research and education that can be cultural functions as well if we decide to integrate those. This is very exciting to me. <laughs> I enjoy this interview so much because I feel like this is a topic that people can latch on to. Like I live in Wisconsin, which is obviously has a lot of agriculture in it. And I feel like I've driven past fields before and been like, why are there just some rando trees like in the middle of that field? Like, why not just crop everything? And I think speaking as as a layperson here, like that is a question of like, well, why aren't you just cropping everywhere? So it's yeah. nice to be able to have a topic where it's like, well, here's why, because, you know, there might be reasons that you need to have some kind of windbreak or something to right. capture nutrients or runoff or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, right. So <laughs> I just feel I'm happy to like be involved in a topic that relates to something in my in my real day to day life uh, more tangibly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, thinking about that Wisconsin landscape where you have probably a lot of livestock, a lot of um, cattle areas mm -hmm. and pasture areas. And so the example in agroforestry of silvopasture brings in that livestock component. And it's um, the idea of having trees and forage and livestock and having those trees out there can provide protection for livestock, just, you know, reduce the harshness of the environment. And of course, having the wind breaks can also help with those too. So yeah, you probably are seeing a lot of agroforestry out there. Yeah, I actually uh, drive past a farm that has cows that like they go under the road in their little tunnel and there's trees on either side and saw some random cows in the woods when I went kayaking yeah, this right. last summer. So they're, right. they're definitely out there. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but there's also two other functions that I wanted to highlight specifically, which took up uh, a pretty decent amount of your chapter and are very cool. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the cultural food function and then climate-based resiliency. So can you talk yeah. about those two? Yeah, the culture-based food supply, and we talked about this some in the chapter, it kind of integrates that those cultural functions along with the production aspect of, of producing edible products for a community. So, of course, trees can produce a lot of different things from timber to craft materials or whatever, but this is kind of specific to the idea of producing con directly consumable things like um, nuts on, on tree crops or berries on shrubs. And so we're really focusing on that human health dimension and looking for opportunities to improve human health through really purposefully designing 
these systems so that they incorporate the edible products that are known to have really high nutritional value. So, you know, the nut trees, the berry shrubs, some of the berries that are that can be grown in these types of systems have are extremely high in antioxidants and just extremely healthy. Um, an example is elderberry, which is common here in Missouri. Missouri is the largest producer in the U.S. of elderberry. And that's one where, you know, it's, it's really becoming more and more well known for its immunity and for its high antioxidant content. And so those grow great in various different types of agroforestry systems. So that's one piece of that. Another topic that we talked about along that line in the chapter was how we can build on traditional ecological knowledge, which is knowledge from indigenous communities who used to perform agroforestry. So agroforestry isn't really, it's not new. It's, it's something um, that was being done by a lot of the indigenous communities before the settlers arrived. And they were using what we call traditional ecological knowledge um, and kind of thinking about that agroforestry and the roots with those communities. And now kind of looking at those traditional systems and how those might serve as actually a model for our contemporary locally adapted food systems. So yeah, that's I think a really important topic and one that's really interesting to reconsider as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then I think the other topic you were interested in, yeah, the improving resilience to climate change is another important area where we're thinking about these different functions. And with agroforestry, what's really neat about it is that we can deal with the climate change question, both from the end of adaptation and from the mitigation perspective. So thinking about, thinking about agroforestry as an adaptation strategy, we're looking again at a diversity of different species. And so, you know, that can help with, you know, having just a wide range of species available for different communities and um, and reducing your risk with having any one species that you're too dependent on. We can also start to even kind of project and predict what the future environment will look like in different areas and start planting those species now to become productive in future years as the, the climate adjusts. So that's one piece of it. And then, and then the mitigation part relates to the ability of these trees to, again, store carbon in their biomass, both what we see, the above ground portion, but also the below ground biomass as well. Hi everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? North American Agroforestry is now available. Use coupon code NAA35 for 35% off through the end of April. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsors, Meter Group and Gazma Technologies. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash field lab earth. For GasNet Technologies, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work weighing 20.7 pounds. The GT5000 Terra is splash-proof IP54 rated with an internal pump and battery and instantaneous readings of up to 50 gases at sub-PPM concentrations. Check out the quick setup guide and learn more about GasMet Technologies at www.gasmet.com and the links in the show notes. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. So I know something that you talked about in your chapter a lot was 
you know, it's easy to think about this on like a farm scale, but then you talked about, you know, really doing this at more of a regional or watershed level. Mm -hmm. Um, Watersheds just being like where water collects and hangs out (laughs) within a given area. It's not the scientific definition, but it's a layman's term that will hopefully be suitable here. Um, But you talked a lot about kind of applying this at a larger scale. So part of that is obviously figuring out what kinds of trees should go where, for what purposes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is how you can do that analysis and not only just, you know, the scientific side of making those decisions, but also, you know, who is involved in making those decisions, like the permissions you need to get from which parties. So can you talk about kind of that overall implementation process at a larger scale? Yeah. And first I can talk kind of about the planning aspect of it. So, you know, we do different types of suitability analysis on the landscape where it's um, basically mapping and taking mapping data and combining different layers of data to um, consider like where might be the strategic placement of certain landscape features, which can help us really prioritize different areas. Um, So one thing that we can do is take data layers like um, the layer for soil types across the landscape, the land cover, the topography, um, various different layers, and run different models to to identify areas based on some set of criteria that we want. So sometimes with agroforestry, what we might be doing is looking for marginal areas or areas areas that aren't super productive for other crops. They're maybe not ideal for annual production systems. So when we identify those areas, they could be prime areas for um, tree type of plantings. So we could do an analysis to just identify those marginal areas and then prioritize resources to maybe help support landowners who would want to um, install an agroforestry planting, maybe through some sort of conservation, government conservation program. The other thing that we can do that's fun when we're talking about tree crops, um, so you can imagine like certain uh, tree nut species like pecan or black walnut and Chinese chestnut, those are three that we do a lot of work with. Well, what we want to do is figure out where are the best areas where that tree can survive and thrive and yield well. And so we know from years of research what characteristics of the soil, um, the aspect or kind of which direction a a hill slope might be facing, um, you know, different things like the hardiness zone areas or how cold it gets in certain areas. And we can start to do a suitability map to identify those areas for certain individual species. So we can do that by each different species to to kind of combine those areas together. So again, if we're thinking about this from a planning perspective, um, we can work, we could work with landowners to say, well, say we found um, that one zone is really well suited to Chinese chestnut. We could potentially go to landowners in that area, kind of start um, sharing some of the resources on what it takes to establish a Chinese chestnut orchard in those areas, let them know that, you know, this is a good zone for this type of crop if you're interested in it. And if if you have these areas where you have a lot of growers together, there might be opportunities to layer on some potential for cooperative land management activities or even co-ops for marketing the different products. If you have a group of growers in a certain area working on that. So in that way, we're kind of even layering on like a, a cultural and economic component to it. Hopefully that wow. sort of makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot in that one. No, it, it absolutely does. It's uh, it's obviously very complicated, but super fascinating. I I adore when these topics are just like this tangled web of just connections across multiple (laughs) fields and people um and communities i mean obviously not tangled in a way that is hopefully (laughs) unproductive (laughs) um or or difficult to untangle or work within but uh it's it's very cool um well thank you for sharing that um 
obviously, as you said, agroforestry has been around for both a very long time, but it's also, uh, you know, there's always advances in it. So to that end, can you tell me about kind of where we're going with agroforestry, what future research you see on the horizon or initiatives? Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, we're, I think probably the biggest area I see for agroforestry's growth and um, kind of really pushing the boundaries and increasing adoption of it would be, well, there are a couple of lines, I guess. So one is to really focus on the specialty crop component. So really looking at these opportunities to bring in um, tree nut species or berry shrubs that have this economic value. So instead of just thinking about, you know, planting any row of trees in your windbreak, is there potential to plant a row of productive species that, that will ultimately harvest, be, have a harvestable product? So I think there's a lot of potential there. And in, in terms of the research related to that, some of these species have a lot of potential for improvement through breeding. So breeding for different types of environments. I'll give you an example of pecan is a species that grows well in Missouri and even grows well in Illinois and other areas, but it's not, it doesn't yield productively in those areas because it's, you know, the growing season isn't long enough. Um, so it does a lot better further south, but we can breed for improving those species for certain characteristics like that. So that's one area. Another area of huge potential, I think, is to connect in with the carbon markets um, as if they become more profitable. So we start to put these economic pieces together, basically, where can we layer on, you know, the, the value of the crop that's being harvested, layer on some value that's being provided for the carbon sequestration that's occurring in those landscapes. And ultimately, hopefully, kind of the sum of all that can help to have these types of systems compete for land use in certain areas. So I think those are really important um, areas of research. Uh, you know, we also talked a little bit about the urban applications, and I think we'll increasingly see growing potential there because that's where the populations exist in, you know, in the greatest density. So even if we we don't really often see it as something where you're going to produce enough for the whole population. That's just not realistic. But we can look at how we integrate some of these systems so in areas where people can really learn about the whole food production system and start thinking about horticultural crops, what it does take to produce food in a local area, and just start you know making those kinds of connections and educating the public. So, yeah, I think those are, you know, some of the key areas that I see that are that connect with my research. Wonderful. Those sound like really great areas to uh, to dive into. So thank you for sharing that as well. I have uh, one final like bonus question, at least at this point. Uh, can we talk about like pine trees and where they fit in with this? Because I feel like my understanding of pine trees as again, not a scientist is that they kind of are not great for this like surrounding soil for other things to live there super easily. So are there possibilities with, you know, Christmas tree farms or, you know, other pine kind of lumber yeah, farms yeah. to incorporate this as well? Yeah, I think there are. So, you know, there are a couple things with, with pine trees, specifically pine pine needles, when they fall to the ground, they do acidify the soil. So they create a high, you know, low pH soil that's highly acidic, which is a whole different condition than certain plants are adapted to. But there are species that are very well adapted to acidic conditions, and one of those is blueberry. So there's definitely potential for kind of that integration between those. The other thing that needs to be considered, not just with pines, but with any evergreen species, is that they're going to be providing a lot of shade. So um, making sure that there's enough space between the rows that the 
whatever crop you're growing in combination with them is still getting enough sunlight to be able to grow effectively. We do see uh, with pines and a number of other kind of timber species um, integration with livestock. So pine plantations can work well if you can get a, a good ground cover and forage for the livestock to graze on. That can be a really good combination as integration of the livestock component. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if you could sneak some livestock in there. So that's good yeah. to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, another important application of pines and other evergreen trees would be something like the um, the windbreak uh, practice that we have. So typically a, wind, a well-designed windbreak is recommended to have a, at least a row of evergreen species so that during the winter when the deciduous trees have lost their leaves that you still get some wind cover. So that's another just important function specifically of, of evergreen species. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. Great. Okay. Well, thank you again for <laughs> answering my uh, kind of spur of the moment questions. <laughs> Obviously, very interesting topic. I have three questions left for you. So the first one is where people can learn more. Um, I'll, I'll just start off by saying, obviously, we do have that special section, um, the new edition of the book, which we have a discount code for. So make sure to check that out in our show notes. But where else can people learn more about this? Yeah. Yeah. So that book, is again, it's a great resource and it is like the textbook for uh, North American agroforestry. So that's a great start. Um, also, a great resource is our Center for Agroforestry website. So that's centerforagroforestry.org. And we just redid our website, which I'm very, very excited about. It had become a little bit dated. So I'm thrilled that we've been able to completely um, redevelop the whole website. And it's a lot more user friendly at this point and kind of a contemporary look, easier to find things. Uh, so that website has all sorts of materials in there. There are so many different resources. Um, there's even a way to go into it through different portals. So whether you're a student or a landowner, you can go into the portal that will kind of curate the information that might be most interesting for you. And we're currently working on developing different web pages for each one of the specialty crops that works well in an agroforestry system. Um, so for our purposes, uh, things like pecan, black walnut, pawpaw, persimmon, elderberry, those are the ones, some of the ones that we'll have a dedicated page for. So a lot of material on there, and through that site, you'll also see events that become available through our center. We just recently had an agroforestry symposium, which was really great, uh, a really active symposium with panels and um, different talks on, on topics related to climate resilience, actually. And so you can find um, those types of events. You can find information on our Agroforestry Academy that we offer every summer. It's a several-day intensive academy focused on agroforestry. So plenty of materials there. Uh, another place that's kind of connected with that is our Mizzou Agroforestry YouTube channel. And if you just go into YouTube and look up Mizzou Agroforestry, you can subscribe to that YouTube channel. And we're adding content on there all the time. We are trying to get a new video, an informative video up about once a week with a new topic area. And we also share like presentations and things like what we had from that symposium. We're getting those closed captioned and everything to be able to offer on that YouTube channel as well. So I think those are probably the, the two main things, the Center for Agroforestry website and the Mizzou Agroforestry YouTube channel. Excellent. We will make sure to include links to both of those resources in our show notes if you want to check them out. And then if people then want to take the next step and get involved with agroforestry or urban agroforestry, what can they do? Yeah. So in addition to kind of just learning more about it from those our website and everything, um, I think if, we're, if you're really interested in kind of thinking about how we increase 
agroforestry in general, kind of across our landscape, you might look into how we advocate for research funding that's really specifically targeted toward agroforestry. You know, some of these minor land use um, land use areas don't, you know, they only receive a fraction of the funding that a lot of um, a lot of different areas do agricultural areas. So if we can advocate for more research in those areas, that helps us do, um, you know, answer the questions that we need to to make it a, a better system, make it a system that's more economically viable. And then the other thing is just to share the concept of agroforestry and those resources with other with landowners that you know or other people who are interested in in food systems questions or agriculture or even environmental sciences or conservation. Nice. Those are great ways to get involved. Thank you for that as well. Final question. What is one fun fact people wouldn't know about you if all they had was your research? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'd have to say that probably since becoming an empty nester, um, probably my biggest passion and hobby would be my two rescue dogs. Um, I'm a little bit maybe too obsessed with them, but I have one big, about 100 pound Great Dane mix. Um, his name is Elliot, and he's just super sweet, super laid back guy. Um, and then I have a medium sized little girl named Artemis. And she's just an awesome hunter. She lives up to her name of being a hunter and just like a good burrowing animal killer. And she just goes and gets it done. So they love hiking around, running, going. They love road trips. They, they'll get in the car anytime I'm jumping in the car. They're ready to go with me and, you know, going on vacation or whatever. They're always game. Oh, I always love pet facts. <laughs> Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sound so lovely. Well, this has been an excellent conversation. Thank you so much for the research you're doing. Um, obviously, for being one of our editors, we appreciate the work you do there. Mm -hmm. And uh, just being an all around wonderful guest. Thank you for being on. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Emanuela. Emanuela, welcome to the show. Can you start off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Thank you, Abby. I'm Emanuela Uswansa, currently a master's student at the University of Idaho, Moscow. And then I'm studying on nutrient management in Wheaton, Silage College. Excellent. And uh, can you tell us a bit about your current research project? All right. So currently, this project is being funded by um, the USDA, SARI, and the Fertilizer Group. And it's um, a three-stage project where we are looking at how to improve nutrient management in wheat, corn, potatoes, and cherries especially during these seasons of drought, how we are going to maximize the nitrogen being applied and also to improve soil health. So that's basically what my project is about. So there are other faculty members at the University of Utah, University of Idaho, and Brigham University. So I'm currently working with Dr. Olga Walsh at the Pama Research and Extension Center and we are just solely looking at winter wheat and then silage corn. Wonderful. And if you could work on any dream project, what would that look like? All right. Um, anything that helps human beings to have a comfortable life is what I'm interested in. And so during my undergraduate, I did a little bit of natural resource management measuring in agroforestry, and currently I'm doing plant science, and I hope to do a more of soil science so that at least we have healthy soil for our crops to grow in, and then as the UN Development Goals seeks to attain zero hunger by 2030, I can give my quota to help do that. Wonderful. Well, if anyone would like to get in touch with Emanuela about her work, we'll have her contact information in the show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you for being on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.